about theory of surplus value, uh, we are going to use a text by Ernst Mandel. He's a very uh, white man from Europe. He was born in, in Germany in 1923, and he became a leader of the International Secretariat of the Fourth International that was a Trotskyist movement. Trotsky was the second in command in the Soviet Union in 1917 when they took over power, the Bolsheviks, and he was very quickly after Lenin died, ousted by Stalin, and he has to run away from uh, Russia and ends up in uh, Mexico, where he's killed by, um, um, what can we call him? a secret agent of, of Stalin. That was Trotsky. This guy, Mandel, is a follower of Trotsky. Uh, he was born, as I said, 1923, and he dies in 1995. Um, during his youth, uh, he experienced Nazism in Germany, and he became a member of a resistance group. He was caught and spent time in a concentration camp during the war. Later on in 1972, he was recognized with a PhD from the Free University of Berlin, and he was one of the most important theoreticians of the uh, working class Marxist left. This guy is not an intellectual, or rather he is an intellectual, but he's not an um, university educated intellectual. Much later he goes to the university, his uh, learnings are from us being self-taught as a member of a leftist organization. So I chose this text instead of Marx's text on surplus value because it's way more accessible, it's written for people, for regular people, and not for academics. Bueno, anyway, he uh, tries to tell the Eurocentric story of how uh, the West came to be what it is today, how we came to be people who work for corporations, rather than hunter-gatherers, as, uh, uh, as um, the idea goes that we all move from being hunter-gatherers or uh, from primitive communism, as very also Eurocentrically Marx call it, to this develop uh, capitalism, develop civilization, Western democracies. So he says that the initial divisions of labor were initially between uh, manual labor and intellectual labor. Uh, but uh, this only happens uh, further up the, the history as initially all labor was just whatever needed to be done and there were no divisions of labor that we know of amongst hunter-gatherers. So he makes a first distinction between socially necessary labor and socially unnecessary labor. This is a very a common Marxist concept, uh, kind of difficult to explain because it has several different meanings. On the one side, socially necessary labor is a labor that we need to do in order to sustain ourselves. Like every morning I have to wake up and if I were a hunter-gatherer, I would have to go and get water or get um, some berries from the trees, depending on the time of the year and where we are camping, me and my group of people, or I might have to go hunting or something around those lines. That would be socially necessary labor. Now, once a society progresses, we have lots of socially unnecessary labor. For example, some people think that um, the police uh, are socially unnecessary labor. Although we do need people to take care of ourselves, many people think that that could be done within the communities and not by paying somebody that most of the time they are not doing something really necessary, but rather following rules and perhaps also in some cases following their own biases and committing some horrendous crimes like we've seen in the streets of Ferguson and other parts of the country. A other ways of uh, talking about socially unnecessary labor is when you are working for somebody else and you work beyond the time that you would need to work to support yourself. All the other time that you work and you're not paid for, uh, that would be socially unnecessary labor and is taken by the person that's hiring you to do a certain job. Other ways of thinking about socially unnecessary labor is if I'm uh, a little clumsy and I take too much time uh, to make this chair that I'm supposed to make. If a chair takes eight hours for most of the population to make and it takes me 15 hours because my hands are not 
appropriate for that kind of t task, then those other hours beyond the eight are also considered socially unnecessary labor. Um, so once uh, Mandel says that once we are able to accumulate enough wealth, and in anthropology we connect this with starting to plant and 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 uh, raise animals. It, we can start di dividing intellectual from manual labor. For example, the labor that I do for you now is 100% intellectual labor, although I'm holding the computer with one hand. Uh, while if when I'm painting my house, although I have to think about where I'm going to paint and what colors I'm going to use, that's manual labor, the way we understand it. So he says that once our basic needs were met, once we were able to produce a little more than everyday food and everyday clothing, we were able also to start producing art. This is also a very uh, clumsy way of thinking about production of art because now we know that hunter-gatherers uh, painted the, the caves where they slept in, for example. So um, take all of this with a grain of salt, all this kind of weird history of, of civilization. But in any case, what we all uh, agree on, whether we agree with the art versus production or intellectual versus manual, what we all, all of us that study this kind of stuff agree on is that the more we specialized, um, the, the less workers could control the whole process of production. So when we were carving things out of rocks or, or when we were um, carving stuff out of wood only, uh, probably we did the whole process. We were able to produce a whole chair. Uh, but nowadays, uh, most workers, especially manual workers, are not able to produce anything in its totality because uh, production it has been uh, highly specialized and you get to uh, turn uh, um, a screw or um, move a handle, but you don't get to do the whole thing. So the more we specialize, the less control the worker has over the whole process of production. Uh, a worker individually would be unable uh, to produce anything uh, as a whole because mo for the most part, we are uh, asked to only perform certain tasks in a repetitive manner, and if we are lucky and we get a promotion, we might get to do another task, but never the whole process. Um, so the issue of alienation that we talked about briefly, I think, in class, arises in the sense that Marx thinks that people put their souls in their work, and then you cannot complete your whole work, so your soul is not really realized in that sense. And also at the same time under capitalism, as we also talked a little bit, especially those of you in 189, under capitalism the worker only takes home part of what they produce, the other part of what they produce is taken by the corporation that hires him or her. So uh, Mandel tries to think why societies and how societies divided in classes and remember that for Marxists, class is not the same as for sociologists. The fact that my mother, for example, was a maid and I am a professor, uh, for a Marxist doesn't really put us in different classes because my mom had to work for somebody else to get paid to bring home some food. And I also have to work for somebody else to get paid to bring home food. Both of us, for Marxists, are working class people, although, of course, they recognize that I have better than my mom had it because I don't have to uh, clean people's bathrooms. Uh, but uh, when it goes down to whether I own the means of production, whether I own the factories, I own the land that can produce uh commodities to be sold in the market, well, both my mom and I were in the same class in the sense that we don't have cap we didn't have capital. She didn't have capital and I don't have capital to be able to sell something in the market. Um, so he says that once uh, humans could produce more than what they needed for themselves, a certain sector of society became liberated from working for basic needs and uh, what we uh, need, he says, to reproduce ourselves is what we call necessary labor. So some people were able to do the necessary labor for everybody, and that liberated those that had these people working for them from doing certain manual labor. 
For example, if you think of Greece, of ancient Greece, classic Greece, the Greece of the philosophers that we study, these philosophers were doing only uh, intellectual labor and they were wealthy people that owned slaves. The slaves did the necessary labor for them. The slaves toiled the fields, the slaves cleaned their houses, the slaves uh, built the aqueducts so that they could take water from one place to the other, etc., etc., etc. While the philosophers that owned the slaves, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and many others, they mostly just taught uh, to other wealthy people like themselves how to think and uh, what to do with society. It, so there's necessary labor, which is the labor that I need to produce every day to support myself and stay healthy. And then there's a surplus labor. It's the labor that I don't need to do to support myself. And depending on the different times uh, and different what Marx is called modes of production, this uh, surplus labor took different uh, forms. So during medieval ages, before capitalism in Europe, the serf, who were the peasants that were locked to the land, the feudal lord owned the land and the peasants in the land. They were not slaves, but they were tied to the land. Those serfs worked three days to reproduce their needs, to be able to feed themselves, clothe themselves, etc. And then the other three days went to the feudal lord, who were the ruling class at the time. So I work three days to feed myself, and the other three days I might be working on the same. I might be still uh, producing wheat or potatoes or whatever, but those potatoes and that wheat is going to go to the feudal lord. I don't get to keep that. So that's a surplus labor. Necessary labor were the three days that the serf needed to work for themselves. But then you had another three days of the week that was a surplus labor, and that labor was not necessary for the serf, but it was meant to uh, support and uh, enrich the feudal lord, who were the ruling classes at the time. So necessary labor versus surplus product, necessary product versus surplus product. So surplus value is a monetary form of surplus product. When the feudal lord uh, cashed, those three days of the serfs work in the market, that was a surplus value becoming uh, money. So surplus product of those three days becomes a surplus value, the money that was extracted from the work of the serf. A surplus value then is the result of the unpaid work of the serf that goes to support the Lord. And Mandel explains that the situation under capitalism is not very different. We don't say, well, I work three days for Exxon Corporation and three days for myself, but at the end of the month or the week or the day, however we are paid, we only get paid the necessary uh, surplus, uh, the necessary labor that we produce and the value that we need to support ourselves. So we don't take home under capitalism either, all the money that we make, uh, in, that we could make once our products are sold in the market, we only take home what we need to reproduce our needs. So this leads to the discussion of what's a commodity, what's use value, and what's exchange value. Use value is the value that something has for the person that's using it. So, for example, I have a nice garden. I don't, but I could have a nice garden outside of my window. And that garden, uh, in that garden, I plant potatoes and beans and whatever. But I don't sell those potatoes and beans in the market. I cook them and I eat them myself, my family and my friends. So those potatoes have use value for me, but they don't have exchange value because I'm not taking those potatoes to the market so that I can get some money to buy bread. I'm just eating them myself. So exchange value as opposed to use value is the value that I can get for that same potato in the market. So if I'm going to eat the potato myself, that potato has use value. If I'm going to sell it in the market, that potato has also exchange value, right? So a commodity is a stuff produced for exchange in the market. 
So the potato might be exactly the same potato, but if I produce it for the market, it's a commodity. If I produce it for myself, it just has use value because I'm going to eat it and it's going to be good for me. But the commodity in reality has, has both values because the veggie or the potato that I buy at the market is good for me. It has use value, but at the same time, it has exchange value because I bought it in the market and I had to pay money for it or I had to exchange it for something else. So what... Uh, Mandel explains is that under capitalism, most of the production is of commodities rather than stuff for personal use. I, under capitalism, some of us have, have veggie gardens, but most of us just go to work, get a certain amount of money, whatever we can get, and then we use that money in the market to buy these commodities that are these potatoes that then have use value when I eat them. So Mandel talks about alienation and labor. I have to say that this is a part of the lecture that I always teach with the least conviction. Um, alienation, I think, is way more complicated than losing your soul over the work that you don't get paid for. But I'm going to be honest to Marx and Mandel, and I'm just going to explain the theory. So uh, Mandel explains that at the uh, beginnings of what he thinks was uh, the, the beginning of capitalism, this uh, uh, moment of uh, hunter-gatherers, or if we want to call it primitive communism, as Marx called it, or uh, state of nature, as our liberal classic friends call it, a art was a natural part of the process of making stuff for ourselves or our families. It wasn't separated from the useful objects. So if I was going to uh, make, I don't know, a pot, probably I would draw something beautiful on that pot. But I wasn't going to draw something beautiful on a wall just to watch it. Again, this seems to have been uh, negated by uh, findings such as the Altamira uh, cave um, drawings, beautiful drawings that supposedly come from our days as hunter-gatherers eh, that were painted on a wall in a cave and don't seem to have any kind of use value whatsoever except that they're be very beautiful to look at. Eh, so, uh, but in any case, uh, what he says is that under capitalism, most production is mechanical and repetitive, and we don't put any art into the stuff we do unless it's mandated by, by the factory that we are working for. If they tell us to make a pot and paint a flower on it, well, there will be a flower on that pot. But it's mostly not done uh, by hand, and it's not done in a creative way. It's repetitive and mechanical, even if it's beautiful. On the other hand, in non-capitalist societies, we know, and we still see that in many societies that are non-capitalist, people work less hours and they know why they are working. While under capitalism, you just tighten that, that screw, but you don't necessarily know exactly where the whole process is leading or how it's done. Uh, but he says, and this is also another trope of Marxism, that these societies that are non-capitalists and mostly produce a uh, use value, mostly produce stuff for their use and not for exchange in the market, are poor. By this they mean that they don't have excess product, excess commodities that they cannot save for a rainy day, for example, and they cannot accumulate to be able to uh, then buy something bigger and get something done that they weren't, be able, to, weren't able to do before. Um, so he says that this is the, the, the catch-22 situation. Under capitalism, we are alienated because we don't get to keep what we make, because we don't get to do it in an artistic manner. We are only repeating what other people tell us to do. It's mechanical. It kills us. And most of the work that we do is appropriated by somebody else, by the capitalists that hire us. But at the same time, this leads to, not necessarily myself, but societies that have more wealth than societies that uh, rely on hunter and gathering and are not capitalist. Uh, but in these other societies, people seem to be happier, while under capitalism, we all know that most of us nowadays take some kind of either something to calm our anxiety, something to lift our moods because we are very often depressed, or some other sort of stuff that helps us cope 
with capitalism. It's very, very common nowadays for people to feel poorly, very common. So he says this is alienation and it's a consequence of working for the market, for working for unknown consumers instead of focusing on consumption that is for ourselves, our friends and our families. He says humans put their souls in their work and when the product of their work is taken away, their souls are alienated. So this in a nutshell is the theory of alienation that Marx put together, which is based on the theory of surplus product and surplus value. Remember, it's not Mandel who came up with this theory, it's Marx, only Mandel is making it a little more accessible to us. Um, so uh, he says, and this is also another very common Marxist trope, that societies organize around labor. And if you think of your own lives and the lives of your parents, a lot of what we do is organize around the fact that we have to go to work at certain times of the day, or we have to prepare for work, or we have to study so, so many years, as you know so well right now, to be able to work in the future and get paid well. So he says when commodity production is at its highest, societies organize around the needs of labor, as opposed to the needs of humans. For example, in the United States, uh, we all know that women have to come to work very, very soon after they give birth because we don't have a national law that protects uh, women who give uh, birth. In some European countries, both women and men who become parents are given uh, time off from work, but in the United States, that's up to your employer. There are certain jobs where you can get some time off and most jobs you cannot. So if society were organized around human needs, we would all have maternity leave because both parents should be involved in the taking care of the child. But as society, especially US society, is organized and around the needs of labor, we don't have much maternity leave and it's very common to see mothers come to work still experiencing, experiencing much of the pains and um, discomforts that um, giving birth to a child produces, plus the child is not taken care of as the child could be taken care of if either or both the mom and the dad were home for a longer period of time. And he says that before capitalism, in small-scale commodity production, exchange was governed by an equivalence in work hours. So what he's saying here is that um, we know how to exchange goods because we think of how hard it is to produce that good, whether, be, whether it is because it's a rare metal that is difficult to find or if, or, or if it's because it requires a lot of labor to produce. Uh, he thinks that when society starts exchange, societies start exchanging uh, commodities, they are exchanging it mostly based on how long it takes to, to make them which is different from what we do now, that we seem to have prices for everything and, and, and it looks as if most of what we pay for is based on uh, whether a capitalist can sell it or not. The Marxists will say, yes, that's true. Nowadays, the market can make prices fluctuate up and down quite considerably, but still the reason why we can exchange these goods is because we know how long it takes to make them. So the exchange value of commodities. The exchange value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor necessary to produce it. How many hours do I have to spend at the wheel to make this, uh, this beautiful pot? How many hours do I have to spend toiling the fields in order to obtain rutabaga? The exchange is not determined by how much time it takes me to make something, it's determined by what's, what we call socially necessary labor, how long it takes average for all of us to produce a rutabaga. Socially necessary labor, again, uh, we can talk about that because the value of exchange of commodities is determined by socially necessary labor and increases in productivity create a surplus profit. So what this means is if I can make you, my workers, work faster at that machine or cut faster that fish, 
at the end of the day, you will still get paid the same amount of money, but I will be able to sell, I, the owner of the fishery, will be able to sell more filleted fish because I made you work faster. So that means that the value can be uh, altered some because I make you work faster. So he says this process is repeated every time there is a decrease in the amount of socially necessary labor to create a commodity. So when, when we say, well, this stuff recently got cheaper, Mandel thinks in most cases it's because we were able to find a way to uh, use less labor to make this stuff that we were making before in 10 hours. Now, either because we invented a machine that makes the process go faster or because I'm a really mean manager and I found a way to make you work faster, the, um, the, re the, the result in any case is that there was less necessary labor to produce that commodity, so that might uh, end in a, in a decrease in price. So he says that surplus value is a monetary form, the money of the social surplus that the workers do not receive. That amount of time that you work for the feudal lord in the past or the, for the capitalists nowadays, but you don't get to take home. The living cost of labor power constitutes its value. The worker is paid what the worker needs to reproduce it, its needs. So a worker in China might need $100 to reproduce their needs, but a worker in the United States might need $1,000 to reproduce those same needs. So the needs might not be the same because according to how much uh, people have struggled in the past is how much need the capitalists will recognize. Uh, but also not only the need might not be the same, but also uh, the prices of the commodities that the worker will need to reproduce their life might be different too. So it doesn't mean that workers receive the same amount of money all over the world for the same amount of work because this uh, living cost is very much the result of past struggles of workers who managed to extract some of that surplus value that was appropriated by the capitalists for themselves and incorporated into the regular salary but it might also be connected with how much money people actually need to buy their stuff. So he says, surplus value is the difference between this living cost and the value created by this labor power. The capitalist keeps the value created by the worker as the worker is not pay all of the value she produces, but rather just what is necessary to reproduce her needs. So if you think of this, uh, of this equation, uh, uh, think about modern capitalism, neoliberalism or globalization, uh, what we are living through now, and it makes a lot of sense then for um, people in the capitalists in the United States to take their jobs uh, and the production that needs to happen uh, to China, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, or some other global South countries like Mexico, where socially necessary labor is paid uh, less than in the United States because these workers are not unionized, these workers were not able to uh, have their employers pay them uh, healthy salaries or uh, uh, cover um, health cost needs or pensions or a number of other things that workers in the United States had been able to achieve through much struggle and organizing and now uh, they have lost, specifically because capitalists were able to take these jobs elsewhere, where the uh, reproductive labor, the labor that is necessary and what that is paid is much less than what they pay in the United States. So Mandel tries to offer some proof. Uh, some of you who are really good at math might be able to tell if the numbers that he produces uh, are convincing or not. I didn't even try, I'll be honest. <laughs> I go more for the um, symbolic aspects of this. So Marx said that there needs to be something that all commodities have in common in order for us to be able to exchange one for the other. How do I know how, can, uh, how much money uh, gold is worth as opposed to how much money a plant that I love is worth if I don't look 
uh, at how hard it was to obtain that goal or to produce that plant. So Marx thinks that although there might be a lot of uh, fluctuations in the market and prices might go up or go down, the reason why we can exchange money uh, for, for a commodity is because we know more or less what amount of socially necessary labor was involved in the making of this object. Um, proof by reduction to the absurd. That's another way of thinking about this. If there were no workers and all production were mechanical, nobody would be able to buy anything because nobody would have a salary. Uh, again, grain of salt here because in Europe and in other places, many capitalists and some government officials are thinking that since unemployment uh, in capitalist countries uh, is growing exponentially because we are taking all of our jobs elsewhere where it's cheaper to pay workers for their socially necessary labor, um, it might be that uh, people will start getting a uh, basic income, universal basic income, so that everybody gets, I don't know, 2,000 bucks every month, and then uh, production is something that happens mostly in other countries or by mechanical means. So there will be very few people working behind the scenes, lots of robots doing the jobs that now we are making, and uh, folks receiving a universal uh, income, uh, a stipend, basically, uh, out of the uh, production that happens in other countries. That is to say, we will still be parasiting uh, laborers in other countries, but without the need to uh, try and find a job, which is g getting increasingly difficult in this industrialized nation, especially in the United States. So um, that's more or less the idea behind the theory of surplus value. Uh, we can find holes and problems, but uh, in general, this is what we uh, leftists think uh, justifies, for example, revolutions, justify the takeover of factories uh, and a number of other actions that capitalists consider um, criminal, we think of them as reappropriation because um, the Exxon Corporation of today probably has its origin somehow in the Industrial Revolution of the 1800 in England. And since then, and even before that, all the capital in the world, all the value that was created in the world was value and capital that came out of the labor of our ancestors, of the working class people that had been toiling for feudal lords and for corporations since the beginning of time in the West. So when we take, we the workers take over a factory or enact a revolution and take over a whole country and expropriate the banks and expropriate the corporations, all we are doing is recovering, reappropriating this surplus value that was taken from us, the working class, since the beginning of time.